Hi, and welcome to Crosswind United Methodist Church. My name is Nick Robinson. We are outside the church getting ready to go in for worship today. Today, as we worship together, I want to invite you to grab a Bible because we're going to be spending some time in the Word of God to grab a journal in case you want to write down any thoughts or questions and to grab a candle and light it. Let's worship together. Good morning. It is a holiday weekend, and that means tomorrow is the day that we set aside as Memorial Day. Memorial Day is a very important day in our country as we remember the men and women, some by choice, some because they were drafted, have given their lives in service to this country, made a great sacrifice on our behalf, and that some of them have family who remain and grieve that loss, but all of us still live in a land that is free because of the service they have done. Um, it's not necessarily a happy day, uh, but it is a day for gratefulness and thankfulness. So we're mindful that others have done something for us that either we, um, some have served and, and didn't, die in service. And some of us, like me, have never served. And as a minister of the gospel, I am always reminded that the reason that we can gather here, even on a holiday weekend, and worship God and not worry about being arrested is because others have worked to make that possible for us. Uh, and so I just want to invite you for a moment to join me in a moment of silence as we take just a moment today in this service to remember what we'll remember all day tomorrow. Gracious God, we know that in you, every life is of infinite worth. And God, we each are trusted with our lives and given the freedom and the power to choose what to do with them. And God, there are many who have chosen to serve us by serving our country. And from those, there are many who have died in that line of service. That we will never know all of the stories. All of the horrors that have been seen, the pain that has been felt. Uh, the brotherhood and sisterhood that has been experienced with fellow service people. So God, here today, give us grateful hearts. That no matter who serves, those who have given their life for us, we would be grateful for that. We pray that you would bless the families who are left behind in, in grieving today. We pray that you would um, be with those who have served and have witnessed the people they were close to dying in that line of service. God, may we not take this for granted. May we be thankful. In your son's name we pray. Amen. So in service today, we, um, we also brought the plate forward to bless as part of our offering. Uh, so the, ta uh, the plate is still going to remain in the lobby for right now. Uh, so you can give on your way in or on your way out. One of the ways that we give also is the little piece of white paper that's usually in your seat or a seat next to you. Because uh, finances are one way that we give. A way that I like to give is by donating blood because it's uncomfortable, but it's, uh, it gives a, I, have, I have more blood than I need, apparently, at least enough that they can take some out and give it to someone else. And so uh, it's an, a way for me to give that doesn't really cost me much other than about an hour of my time. Another way that we give is with our presence, and on that card, that little white piece of paper, it's a way to write down your presence, but also to write down prayers. Prayers is another way that we give and serve to God. So if there's anything that needs prayed for, make sure to mark it on the white 
piece of paper and drop it in the plate. Uh, you can all, I give online. That's how I give. So that's one more way you can give financially to the church um, is by giving through our online giving, which you can find through the church's website. Today, our scripture reading comes from John chapter 3. I think if you've been in the church very many times, or maybe even just to the Indy 500 very many times, you will recognize some of the words in this chapter. There was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a Jewish leader. He came to Jesus at night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could do these miraculous signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered, I assure you, unless someone is born anew, it's not possible to see God's kingdom. Nicodemus asked, how is it possible for an adult to be born? It's impossible to enter the mother's womb for a second time and be born, isn't it? Jesus answered, I assure you, unless someone is born of water and the Spirit, it's not possible to enter God's kingdom. Whatever is born of the flesh is flesh. And whatever is born of the Spirit is spirit. Don't be surprised that I said to you, you must be born anew. God's Spirit blows wherever it wishes. You hear its sound, but you don't know where it comes from or where it is going. It's the same with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said, how are these things possible? Jesus answered, you are a teacher of Israel and you don't know these things? I assure you that we speak about what we know and testify about what we have seen but you don't receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you don't believe, how will you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has gone up to heaven except the one who came down from heaven, the human one. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so much must the human one be lifted up so that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him won't perish, but will have eternal life. God didn't send his son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him isn't judged. Whoever doesn't believe in him is already judged because they don't believe in the name of God's only son. This is the basis for judgment. The light came into the world and people loved darkness more than the light. For their actions are evil. All who do wicked things hate the light and don't come to the light for fear that their actions will be exposed to the light. Whoever does the truth comes to the light so that it can be seen that their actions were done in God. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Gracious God, shine your light on our hearts, our souls, our minds, our actions, our entire lives. God, drive out the darkness that is hanging in the crooks and the crannies of our lives. God, help us to be born by the Spirit and born anew in you so that we might see the kingdom and participate in your kingdom. God, this morning we pray for those who grieve. We pray for those who are lost, those who need to know your love for them but don't know it yet. We pray for those who don't have enough, and we pray even, God, for ourselves that you would live in us. It's in your Son's name we pray. Amen. There are certain questions that you only ask when you know no one else is listening. Nicodemus has come to Jesus at nighttime when no one is around, probably because he's a little embarrassed to be seen, seen talking to Jesus, being you know, a very important person and Jesus being who Jesus is, but probably also because he has a question to ask him that he's afraid to ask him in daylight. Who can be born again? What does all of this mean? To start answering that question, I want to think about the time we were first born. I want you to think back to the day that you were born. Think about how cozy you were inside the womb. The world was present out there, but you were safe from it in there, most likely. And it was comfortable. And then something happened. And you got an eviction notice. 
And it was time to leave that place of safety and comfort and enter into the world. And now it may have been comfortable or uncomfortable for you to do that. And for, for the person who gave birth to you, it probably was extra uncomfortable. The process of giving birth um, happens in all different kinds of ways. Uh, sometimes it's by C-section. Sometimes uh, it's induced. Sometimes with an epidural. Sometimes not. And then there's some of us who all we can do is stand by and watch. We can't uh, contribute much to the process. So I want you to think about the time, the day you were born. So I was born technically in Louisville, Kentucky. Technically, I'm from Kentucky. I don't like to tell people that because when you're from Indiana and you're from Kentucky, well, when you live in Indiana and you're from Kentucky, well, they're hillbillies and we're not, right? Um, but back then, that's where the hospital was. So if you were going to get born, you needed to go over to the hospital to be born. So I, went, I was born at Audubon Hospital. And the places that we are born, not necessarily literally the hospitals, but the families that we are raised in, the cities that we belong to, shape who we are. So I was born in Louisville, Kentucky. I was raised in New Albany, Indiana. And there is a word that I use that other people don't use, at least not the way I use it. And I'm trying to teach it to my daughters, even though I'm pretty sure I'm going to fail unless they use this word in Columbus, and I have no idea if they do. But I say, I say the word toboggan, not to describe a sled that you ride down a hill, but the kind of hat that you would wear on your head in winter and would cover your ears when it's cold outside. This is an accident of being born in southern Indiana. There's another accident of being born in southern Indiana. I love basketball. I'm not very good at basketball. I told you how I didn't even make the team in sixth grade, right? Uh, I'm not very good, but I love it. Because in growing up, we had season tickets to basketball. Not to the U of L Cardinals, uh, not to the Indiana Pacers, but to our local high school team. Because that's what you do in Indiana, especially before class basketball happened. The travesty that is class basketball. It's a sermon for another day. But, but I love basketball. If I'd been born in Texas, I'd probably love football. If I was born in Paris, France, I would probably love football, but not the kind they play in Texas, right? It's an accident of where I was born. It's an important part of me, liking basketball. Uh, it's something that I would not give up readily, but it is something that happened because of where I was born. Another thing that happened, I grew up in a really unique household. We spoke two languages. I may not have told you this before. We spoke English, and we spoke sarcasm. And so I grew up fluent and sarcasm. Now, sometimes sarcasm is just funny, and sometimes it's being mean and saying you're trying to be funny. And so sometimes it works well, and sometimes it doesn't, and it's been used both ways in my house. Now, Elena was born in Fort Wayne, and they use a weird word there, too. It's called addition. No, I know what addition is. I went to school. Hey, I even made it through calculus. I did so much addition, you have no idea. But for her, addition means a neighborhood where there's houses. It's been built as an addition. I was like, that's not an addition. It's a neighborhood. Where we are born determines parts of our lives. One of the things that was partially determined by where I was born is I'm a believer in Jesus Christ. I believe that Jesus rose from, lived, died, rose from the grave, and ascended into heaven that I might know him and know the power of love and experience forgiveness in my life. If I had been born in Iran, I may not have had that same benefit in my life. There are parts of our lives that are only parts of our lives because of where we were born. And so yesterday was my oldest nephew's seventh birthday. And when he was born into the world, my world changed. So when we are born for the first time, our world changed because we go from the comfort of the womb into the terror that is being alive in the real world. When he entered the world, he also did a lot of things. He convinced me that even I could be a dad. Because I held him, and I didn't break him, as far as we can tell. I also witnessed my younger brother being a dad. And if he can be a dad, I can do it better. When people are born into the world, it changes things. Edith was born in Fort Wayne and lived there for two days, and then grew up here in Logansport for the first four years of her life. Ada was born in Logansport and grew up here for the first 1.6 years. One, yeah, somewhere around there, of her life. It would be interesting to see how that affects 
their upbringing. So there are parts of our lives that are determined by where we are born. When we are reborn in the Spirit, when we are born anew, when we are born again, there are parts of our life that are changed. There are accidents of our life. There are attributes of our life that are only true because we have been born of the Spirit, because we have been born of God. And the Holy Spirit plays an important role in this process. Jesus here in the book of John calls it being born by water and the Spirit, which we often take uh, to mean through baptism and through the laying on of hands, asking the Holy Spirit to be in part of someone's life, but also being born kind of a biological birth and then also being born in a spiritual birth. So we talked about the Holy Spirit's role starting last week. Last week was Pentecost, and we talked about how the Holy Spirit showed up on, in Acts chapter 2, uh, and people started speaking in languages, probably not sarcasm, but a, a variety of languages, and other people could understand what they were saying. It was a testimony to the power of God that surprised people incredibly. It surprised them so much, they made an excuse to deny it and said, well, those people are just drunk. It's, it's not even the spirit. It, it is alcohol that has done this to them. And then we also read from the book of John, and Jesus in the book of John taught us about some of these things in the Holy Spirit. The, the Holy Spirit convicts the world. It teaches the world that it's wrong about righteousness, that it's wrong about sin, and it's wrong about judgment. But also learn that the Spirit is a Spirit of truth that convicts us too. That the Spirit lives in our hearts and our lives and uh, needs to be in tune with us. And when it's out of tune, the Spirit's going to start driving those bad things out of us. And so here we are in John, again, in the very beginning of John. And someone, a faithful person, a person who has tried to follow God their whole lives possibly, has come to Jesus under the guise of darkness to ask him an important question. And Jesus starts talking about being born of the Spirit. And there's a couple real benefits to being born of the Spirit. And this is important, those benefits, because Nicodemus, the person who's asking the question, doesn't even think it's possible. So you can't enter the womb again and be born. Who are you? Have you never seen a baby be born before? That just would not work for an adult. But Jesus says there's, there's benefits, that if you're not born of the Spirit, you will miss out on some things. And the first thing that he says in the book of John, chapter 3, is he says, if you're not born of the Spirit, you won't see God's kingdom. If you're not born of the Spirit, you won't see God's kingdom. And this is important. It almost sounds like once you have the Holy Spirit part of your life, you'll see like magical little elves or a different world that's happening next to our world, and they're over here working and over there working. But I think it changes the way that we see the world. In first service, every week we pray the Lord's Prayer, and we pray, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And when we have the Spirit part of our lives, we can see God at work in the world. Not perfectly, not always clearly. Sometimes it's like through a mirror dimly. But we can see that God is at work. And it's the difference between seeing something happen and thinking that it's a coincidence and seeing something happen and saying, God brought that to me. It's a difference of seeing um, that things just happen randomly and seeing that God is at work around us. So having the Spirit in our lives helps us to identify that God is at work, that God is doing things inside of us and around us. Having, being born of the Spirit also allows us to even enter into God's kingdom, both here on this earth, as much as it is present here in this world, but also in the life to come after this one. The most famous part of John chapter 3 is, is Jesus uh, describing himself as God's only son that has been sent to save the world, not to condemn the world, but that whoever believes in him would have life eternal. And so it is through this belief and through this being born of the Spirit that we enter into God's kingdom and we can be participants in the things that God's doing here on earth, but also have confidence that we will enter into God's kingdom in the world to come. And this is the fun part. The Spirit, we don't know where it comes from. We don't know where it's going, Jesus says. We don't know where the Spirit's come from. We don't know where it's going. All we know is that it's here with us and that we are here with it as well. And so since being born again is so important, it would be really tempting to search scriptures and say, okay, where is the definition for what it means to be born again? If it's not crawling back inside of the womb, then how do you do it? What does it mean? And we can kind of search 
There's no index in the back where it says, born again. This is the definition. This is the process. There's no flow chart that says, if you mix these ingredients in a cauldron at this temperature, then you will make a potion that allows you to be born again. There is no manual that says, if you say these words in this incantation, then this spell will happen. And so we're left to search scripture and try to understand this rebirth and this new birth uh, through what we find, even though it's not spelled out clearly. And John Wesley said that it, it's this, and you may have heard these words before, um, if you've ever been to a wedding. That being born again brings us to a place of faith, hope, and love. Faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 13. Faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is love. And so as we are born again in the Spirit, as we accept Jesus into our lives, and we experience a new life in Jesus, some of the things that were part of our lives are, are going to fade away, are going to become less important. We're never going to quit being the person that we were before, but we're going to start becoming a new person starting that moment that we accept Jesus into our lives, starting that moment that we look to the Spirit and say, where are you taking me? Where are we going? We're going to start with faith. Faith is this amazing gift. It's um, a trust and a hope and a belief that we put in, in God who has created us. It's saying that we know that we are people who are created. We did not create ourselves, but that we were created by a God who loves us. Faith is putting trust in Jesus' life, death, and resurrection on our behalf and knowing that we could never have done the work on our own, but knowing that God has loved us so much that God sent his own son on our behalf to do this for us. And all we have to do is see it and accept it. It's about believing in Jesus. It's about trusting God when God tells us our standing in this world, that we are fallen, imperfect people. But it's not just a mental belief. John Wesley in Scripture teaches us, too, that when we have faith, sin starts fleeing out of our lives. Outward sins, things like lying, things like stealing, things like being destructive, hurting people intentionally. Uh, sins, the things that put a block between us and God and the things that put a block between us and God's creation, the people that God loves, the people that Jesus came to live for, die for, uh, and raise from the grave for, uh, the kind of outward sin that we commit starts falling away. There's not room for faith and sin to coexist in our lives. But also having faith not only could, keeps us from preventing the, or enacting the outward sins, but also changes our inward disposition. Changes our experience of inward sin. When we have faith, then we start also having hope. Hope is an expectation of what's to come. We kind of know where we are. We can look around and see some of the accidents of where we are. We can see that we're in a room, that we're in a town, that we're surrounded by certain people. We can see where we are. We're, we have an idea of how we've gotten here. We don't necessarily know where we're going or how we're going to get there from this moment. And hope is being in that moment and knowing that God is in control of what comes next. that no matter what comes, good or bad, that God will be with us in that moment. And even if it's bad, God can use it to do and accomplish good in our life or in the world at hand. And because we know and we have this expectation and this hope in God, we can have a peace that passes understanding. God gave me that gift a while ago around a certain thing, a peace that passes my own understanding. See, I'm a worrier. Scripture says, don't worry. And I said, I'll try that, but maybe I'll start tomorrow, right? Uh, so one of the things that I, I like to worry about is the future of the United Methodist denomination. Now, if you remember back in 2019, we had a very special meeting that none of us went to, uh, as far as I'm aware, that was going to decide what's going to happen to the United Methodist denomination, if it was going to split up or not, and they made a decision, and then immediately afterwards, uh, the conversation about the decision just picked right back up and there's still conversations about, are we going to split or not split? And there have been several meetings scheduled to try to decide what's really going to happen. And I've been a minister now for almost 10 years. And for like seven of those years, I was constantly worried that someone was going to vote and the church was just going to go away. 
We're just going to decide that we just don't like each other enough to do church anymore. Um, Because when you decide to to split a denomination, people don't just split evenly. Sometimes they decide, well, I'm done with this. Uh, There's no guarantee. You don't don't really even know what you're splitting up. And so I have worried for years about that. But then a while ago, um, God said, Nick, I'm in control. I'm, I, you're in my hands. No matter what happens, I'm with you. Now, I wish that meant that God had given me an answer about what was going to happen with the future of the denomination, but that is not what God gave me. God did not give me um, the gift of prophecy that passes everybody's understanding, but a peace that passes understanding, even in the face of unknowing. And it doesn't, wherever we are in life, whether, whatever change we're experiencing right now, we know that in this moment, the Holy Spirit is taking us somewhere, and it is going to go with us. And we can have peace knowing that God goes with us. We know how the story ends in the very end. Faith and hope. And then the greatest of these is love. Love for me is where the the action kind of starts really taking place. Faith is something that you you feel a lot of and it drives sin out of your life. Um, hope is something that you feel and you can kind of live with as your companion. And then love is the thing that you practice. You love God the Father by following God's will and God's direction in your life. You love uh, your neighbor as yourself by helping them, by visiting them, by showing them Christian hospitality, by sometimes being the neighbor that's being helped and not just the person who is doing the helping, but entering into this community of mutuality where we help each other and serve each other. Faith, hope, and love, the greatest of these is love. You are invited to worship again next week, the same time, same place. Until then, go and examine your inner self, nurturing it in Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior. Go and be kind to someone, showing them love, overflowing with words of grace and encouragement. Go in the name of God the Father Almighty, His Son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit, who is with us now and always. Amen.